Hello everyone and welcome to artifact number seven of module two. Today we are going to explore the Gothic architecture primarily in and around the city of Paris. So I give you on the left hand side a map of Europe and then a detail specifically of France on the right hand side to point out some of the places where we're going to visit today. Perhaps the birthplace of Gothic in some ways is Chartres. That's where we see the first Gothic, Gothic building. But we will begin by looking at a little place here, Saint Denis, which is just on the outside of Paris. And if Gothic has a has a has a genesis point, a place where it really began, it's at a church there. We'll also look at Notre Dame, which is a church in Paris. Notre Dame is a school in Indiana. And then we will look at a couple of other really remarkable Gothic churches, one in Amiens and the other in Rheims. And so Gothic, let's talk a little bit about the word Gothic because it was never meant necessarily as a complementary term. We'll, we'll see some art movements um, being named in this kind of way. The word Gothic comes from an Italian art historian from the 16th century by the name of Giorgio Vasari. And if art history has a like a great, 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 great grandfather, it was him. And he believed that the architecture that was prevalent in places like England, France, and Germany was so ugly that only a goth or essentially someone not from Italy would have made it. And so that phrase kind of stuck around to, um, to, to be a name for architecture made between, you know, 1200 and, and, and 1350, give or take. Um, and so it, it's been a, a phrase that's embraced, although it was never meant necessarily as a complimentary one. And if it be true that many great things have small beginnings, one of those small beginnings is with Gothic architecture because we see it first come here in a church called Saint Denis. This church was is an is a earlier Romanesque church, and in 1144, the abbot of the church, his name was Abbot Suger, although honestly you can call him Abbot Sugar because who wouldn't want to be called Abbot Sugar? But Abbot Suger wanted to extend and modify the back end of the church. As you can see here, the front end of the church is kind of Romanesque in a lot of ways. It was built about 75 years beforehand. It has kind of a horizontal front with a vertical, single vertical tower. The, the, the second tower was never actually built. And if we were to look at you know, the portal of it, it's a good, happy Gothic church or Romanesque church. But as we move around to the back of the church, we can see the beginning whispers of Gothic architecture. And so really quickly, I'd like to give you the characteristics of Gothic architecture. Not all Gothic churches have all three of these. Many do. Um, most have at least a couple. And some buildings that are not Gothic have them as well. So it's not as if having one of these makes it a Gothic church. Um, but in Gothic architecture, these three elements show up quite, quite commonly. So to begin with, we have groined or ribbed vaults. We've looked at groin vaults before. In ribbed vaults, rather than a Roman arch being used, a pointed arch is going to be used. And this is going to fundamentally change the interior space. Uh, of Gothic churches. Secondly, Gothic churches will often have stained glass windows. And these windows, the so-called Lux Nuova or New Light, completely transforms interior spaces um, in regards to what they look like. They don't illuminate a church. Um, they provide a mood or feel. So that would be very important, the use of stained glass windows. And then finally, we will have flying buttresses. Flying buttresses are architectural um, elements that rise on the outside of a church to provide just enough inward thrust so that the church itself, the, so that the, the ceiling itself can't fall down. And when we see a flying buttress, I'll point it out and demonstrate how this is working. 
So as I mentioned, this church here, Saint Denis, which is the kind of the ancestral church of of the of the French monarchy, was originally designed as a Romanesque building, and this is the Romanesque front. But if we look at the backside of this church, we can see the ways in which it has distinctions that are uh, that set it apart from its Romanesque brothers and sisters. And so I give you a detail of the choir of San Cernan. San Cernan was a church that we looked at last time. It was a great example of a of a um, of a Romanesque church. Here's the front of it. Here's the back of it. And I want to call your attention here to the apps that's there. This is the plan that you are looking at here. And I just want to call your attention to the black to white ratio. In, in this church, the black to white ratio um, is wall to window. So everywhere you see that there's dark, there's wall, the open spaces are windows. And I don't mean to suggest to you that there are no windows, but there is, like, look at this little nook here, that little Epsidio Chapel. That's a whole lot of black. But in the Gothic time frame, what will happen is through the use of our second elements, or first elements, or ribbed vaults, we're going to be able to create high, higher walls that need less support. And one of the reasons this is possible is because of the unique advantage of working with pointed arches. And so if you look at these lines here, those dotted lines, those are the arching vaults in the ceiling of the church. And we looked at this um, last time when we looked at the plans of church, right? Those X's are kind of the, is the outline of the archway in the ceiling vault. That's kind of complicated. This is certainly so. So there is more, a, a greater level of complication, but the complication isn't there just to make things complicated. Because they're working with pointed arches, and I'll show you in a second, rather than rounded arches, these structures become inherently stronger, which allows them to build them higher, which allows them to have less wall and more window. And so when you look at the outside of the, the apse of Saint Denis, and we look at these vaults here, you can see that we have buttresses here around the spot where the wall is the weakest next to the windows. But we also have columns here supporting the choir as a way of great, creating a greater sense of height. And this is a picture taken of that. And although it might be subtle, I ask you to consider the arches that are present here. This arch there and that arch there is a pointed arch and not a rounded arch. And that creates a greater sense of verticality within these structures. I'll show you a diagram and I think this will make things a little bit clear. So what you're looking at here on the left-hand side is a prototypical Romanesque dome vault. It's a, it's a, 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 a a, a very easy to understand dome vault. We have a barrel vault that goes this way, say from G to E, and we have a barrel vault that goes this way from I to, you know, I through E. And in intersecting two barrel vaults at 90 degrees, we are creating a single point here, F, that is the highest spot in that vault, right? That's the highest spot. Everything that radiates out from F isn't qu quite nearly as tall. And there is a height here, H to G, which is less than the height from, say, F to E. So there is a height distance, right, this way. If we were to drop a stone down and hang it from the ceiling at the level of H, you would see that there's a height of that vault. But when we create a rib vault, with pointed arches, something magical happens. And that is, even if the distance here, say from D to, I don't know if that's C or not, let's call it D to C, even if this distance is the same, and this distance is the same, G to L as that, that the difference between F and L is reduced to almost nothing. And in this vault, if the highest point is this right here, 
in a ribbed vault, we don't really have two highest points. We have two highest lines, this line and this line. This creates a remarkable sense of verticality within Gothic churches. And in Saint-Denis, we're just getting started. Um, as we go along, because it's only in the back end of that church. But when we get to other churches, we will see the ways in which these, the verticality of these buildings is going to be increased by a factor of almost 40%. It's going to be remarkable. And one of the things that transforms the spaces of Gothic churches is stained glass. Stained glass has been around for a really long time. It was not invented during the Gothic time frame. The Egyptians worked within stained glass. And all things considered, stained glass isn't that hard to make. Right? I'll talk about it in a second. And stained glass does not illuminate the interior of a church. I mean, it does in some way, but it doesn't really in others. And what I mean to suggest to you is that if you really want to, to light up an interior space, you use a white light, right? A white light is how you light up a room. Oops, sorry about that. It is through got through stained glass windows that we really um, provide a different sense, a different feel, a different mood. That is what stained glass windows does. Let's talk a little bit about how do you make stained glass windows and why these objects are so important during the Gothic time frame because they have both religious importance but also social and um, political importance as well. So to begin with, we need to talk a little bit about how you make glass. And and I'm not um, a glass, I'm not a glazier, um, but it's not a very difficult process if you can get an oven up to like 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. So first step is you collect a remarkably high grade kind of sand called silica. And silica, when you heat it up to around 1500 degrees, um, be, melts, becomes opaque, and then clear. It's just a chemical process that happens when you introduce a whole lot of heat to a certain chemical compound. It becomes glass. And glass has been around for 4,000 years. And during the Egyptian time frame, what they learned is that if you added different kinds of oxides to that silicon, you could make, you could make different colors of glass. So adding cobalt oxide creates blue glass and ferric oxide creates Red glass and magnesium oxide creates green glass. And I forget how you make yellow glass, but in any case, if you can make blue glass and red glass and yellow glass, my friends, you can take a piece of green, blue glass and a piece of yellow glass and flash it together, like, you know, sandwich it together. And then you get green glass. And if you can make blue, yellow, and red, you can make green, orange, and purple. And because you've always been able to make clear glass, you can then flash green glass with white glass, clear, clear glass to make a light green glass. So quite suddenly, you have nearly a kaleidoscope of colors. Now the ones that show up the best in stained glass are red, green, and blue. Purple at some times too. Those are the colors that we'll see quite a bit of. Now, when you're looking at an image like this, you can see that there's sort of fine detail that like look around the head of Mary or of little baby Jesus doing his blessing gesture that we saw the Arnolfini guy do way back when. Those are painted on. Uh, the, 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 glass, the glass themselves are cut into shapes, placed into a metal framework called caming. K-A-M-E, came. Um, and then they are sort of melted in place, like sort of solidified out. So I'll give you a good example. Um, when I was a kid, my twin sister had a, something called, um, oh gosh, I don't even know what it was called. I almost called it an easy bake oven, but it wasn't that. But they were like sun catcher kits. They still make these today, I'm sure. You know, you put this kind of metal framework on like a piece of tin foil or something and and you put it on a baking sheet. And then in this little box, you put blue pellets and this one red pellets and this one green pellets. And if you do it in the right kind of way, 
and then you bake that thing at 500 degrees for however long you do. When it cools, it's like a little sun catcher and you can be really proud of your art and craft. That is in some ways what is happening in stained glass windows. First step is creating of the glass pieces. And then secondly is putting them into that metal armature so that the, the glass melts, fills in that space, and voila, you have a large scale window set in metal that can then be set into a church. Some churches um, have their original 14th century stained glass window, which is pretty remarkable. I'll show you Saint Chapelle in just a little while. It's a really, really um, fabulous space in Paris that has 80% of its original windows. Some windows uh, are much more modern restorations, and I'll show you some of those in just a second. Interestingly, um, I have a postcard somewhere. I don't know where it is. My great uncle bought it um, in in World War II. Just after World War II, he was a fighter pilot, or not a, fight, a bomber pilot in World War II. And after the war, he went back and bought a bunch of postcards. And some of the postcards were of some of these churches and what they looked like in 1942, 1943, because they had taken all of the stained glass windows out of them. Bombs and stained glass windows are not good bedfellows. And so it was the churches look like these very unusual skeletons. I wanted to give you a, uh, a stained glass window from Saint-Denis that speaks to the function um, of this church in some ways, because it was the ancestral church of the French monarchy, the Bourbon family, um, and so much so that this was where French kings were crowned. And this is a window uh, from uh, from the middle part of the 19th century. And let me see if I can translate it for you. Um, Louis Philippe, the king of the French, accompanied by his family, visits uh, the Royal Abbey of Saint-Denis on the 24th July, 1837. This is a modern window. There is in Washington, D.C., the National Cathedral. It is fabulous. The church was built, uh, was begun around 1890. Um, and uh, was still being completed in the, the end of the 20th century. But all the stained glass windows from that are remarkably modern. There are There's a World War II window with paratroopers on it, and there's a, a, a window with a moon rock in it. So sometimes the windows are much, much newer. That's a great introduction to the birthplace of, of, of Gothic, art, Gothic architecture, particularly in France. Now let's look at the first real French cathedral that was built entirely as a French cathedral. This cathedral is called Chartres Cathedral. If you must know, it's actually called like the, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, but it's in Chartres. And so we call all of the cathedrals usually after the town in which it resides. So we'll have to say something a little bit about the word cathedral because we've kind of we've never really done that yet. Um, but for the time being, the official name is like the Church of Our Lady or Notre Dame. But there's only one real Notre Dame, Notre Dame. That's in Paris. The other ones we refer to um, after the city in which they are or the town in which they are. So I often will like put a tricky question on a quiz like where is Chartres Cathedral located? And the answer is Chartres. All right. This building was begun, uh, the facade was begun in 1145. That's where we begin the west facade. And again, this is on the, west, the front of a church is off on the west side. This church was created to hold a holy relic, um, the mantle of the Virgin Mary. So you can think of like a kind of a shoulder, uh, shoulder um, shawl. Um, and people came from all over Europe to see this relic. However, unfortunately, in, seven, in 1194, a fire tore down the back end of the church. Much of it had already been completed. And despite this fact, in a quite amazing sort of holy intervention, the mantle of the Holy Mary, of, of the Virgin Mary, was not destroyed, which was a good thing. Otherwise, nobody would come to your church. And so they created a new back end of the church. Uh, and I'll show you some of pictures of the outside in a second. When you look at the outside of this church and even this exterior view here, you might notice something a wee bit peculiar about it. And that wee bit peculiar part is the fact that the North Tower, this one, and the South Tower, that one, 
look different. They're different. And the reason for this is actually quite simple. And I'll get to that in just a second. If you were to think about it really critically, and even though you don't know anything about dating, you might be able to guess that this is the older of the two towers. Another obligatory, uh, obligatory aerial view. And you get the idea, don't you, that there's not a lot around this place. And so we'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in but a moment. But as a way to get about this, I'll give you an example. And this example will date me and it will kind of date you. And maybe it'll date your teacher for all I know. Um, but here we go. I give you sync. Now, I'm 44. And I remember when I was in college from from when I was 20 until I was 25. So from the, from my last year as an under, last two years as an undergraduate student, and then the three years I worked on my master's. And until I went to go get my PhD, I worked as a DJ at a roller skating rink. And if I had a nickel for every time a teenage girl asked me to play in sync, I would have a pocket full of money. And that same teenage girl, a decade later, if you were to ask her, what is your favorite member of NSYNC? I mean, is it is it the, the one guy with talent, Justin Timberlake, or is it the, the Lance guy who doesn't do anything but kind of, you know, hop around? Or is it, you know, this guy? I mean, as far as I could tell, it was this guy who could sing and dance and is kind of charismatic and people still know who he is. And that guy who could sort of sing, but I forget his name. And that guy and that guy and that guy who were merely there to fill out the group. Um, and if I were to ask that that 30-year-old woman, um, you know, what do you think about NSYNC? She's like, I don't like NSYNC. And I would look at her and shake my head and say, you don't lie to me. I know you loved NSYNC when you were 12. You loved them. You loved Bye Bye Bye. You loved, uh, you loved all of their tunes. I loved all of their tunes. They were awesome. But now we admit, or now we try to deny our love for NSYNC. Not me. I love them. And, I, and sadly, I don't think the video is going to play here. Let's see if it's going to play. Nope. Darn it. No video. The moral of that story is pretty simple. Tastes change over time. They do. I'm, you know, I've been, so I, my first semester teaching at the University of Arizona was in the fall of 1999. And that was really the first time I ever wore a tie. I mean, I, I wore a shirt and tie every day I, every day I taught. And I still have ties um, that I've had that long. And if I were to go grab one of those ties and, and then put it next to a tie I bought in the summer of 2019 in Siena, you would notice some things about those ties. One, the width of the tie has changed. Ties now are just a little bit, not a whole lot, just a little bit slimmer than what they were 20 years ago. And the reason for this is simple. Tastes change over time. Tastes change as it pertains to music, the width of my ties, the cut of my pants, the fit of my shirt. And it certainly changes with architectural styles, especially when we consider the following truth. This church here took hundreds of years to make. And you might think like I'm exaggerating, like I'm being parabolic, that I'm being extravagant. This church take took hundreds of years to make. And we've already talked a little bit about that when we looked at the cathedral in Cologne, right? The cathedral in Cologne, this one right here, 1248 to 1880. My goodness. And so if my if the cut of my pants changes over the course of 20 years, can you imagine how the architectural styles will change over the course of 20 years and 200 years to say nothing of sculpture? So we'll see all of that as we walk around the exterior of this churches. As lovely as the interiors are, the exteriors are even more extravagant. So I give you a plan of our church and you can see like it's on Cernan, we have these little obsidial chapels that bubble around it. These was, was for the holy relics. And in some ways, this church serves the same function as that in Toulouse. Now, let's talk about the word cathedral because we haven't really done that work before and it's important to get words right. Cathedral is not a word that means big church. 
cathedrals usually are big churches. I actually can't think of a, of a cathedral that's not a big church, but it doesn't mean big church. A, big, a church can be big and not be a cathedral. In order for a church, big or otherwise, to be a cathedral, what it needs to have is a special chair upon which only the bishop can sit. The cathedral, a cathedral is a church that houses a bishop. A bishop is a kind of a rank of the, of the Catholic church. The word chair in Latin is cathedra. So cathedrals have a bishop, and I bet the bishop of, of this place is called the Archbishop of Chartres. <laughs> There's also the Archbishop of Paris. There's an archbishop of most places, right? The, uh, I mean, most places in Europe where Catholicism is very, is very prevalent. So um, in 2013, I was teaching at a university in Poland as part of a Fulbright program as a Fulbright scholar. And I went to Krakow. And in Krakow is the cathedral there. They call it the Warvel. Um, and the Archbishop of Krakow sits there. And in the 1970s, the Archbishop of Krakow was the man who would become Pope John Paul II. So this is a special church that has a special chair that the Archbishop sits upon. And you can see here that the proportions of the church have changed slightly. We have a single side aisle on the front end of the nave. We still have our crossing and we have two side aisles on the eastern part of the nave and then a really extravagant vaulted choir where the absidial chapels are. When we look at the inside, you will see that the inside is made up of pointed arches, which create a greater sense of verticality about this space. Let me see if I can go back. I want to call your attention to this structure right here. You see these little arches that come up? Those are the beginning of flying buttresses. You'll see them with great clarity when we get to Paris. You can see them back here on the, the, the back of the church here. Those are flying buttresses. So I wanted to make you aware of all of that. So let's talk about the function of these churches. And this was a picture I found, goodness knows when it's from, I'm guessing uh, the 20s or the 30s. And it's important to note that this church can house way more people than lived in Chartres when during the time it was constructed. Like, and this seems like a weird thing, right? Like why would you create a church that's bigger than the town? And the answer, it's actually kind of easy once you get there. This wasn't made just for the city, the people who lived in the town, I should say. It was actually made for all of the pilgrims who are visiting there from all over Europe. And so if you are visiting this, you are likely walking from a great distance. And, and this church, which is kind of up on a hill, can be seen from 30 miles away. Like, isn't that amazing? 30 miles away. Now, to give you an idea about this, um, in, in the summer of 2019, when I was um, in, in France walking with students, my biggest walking day during all of that was about 18 miles. Like, and at the end of that day, I was beat. That was a, a 30,000 step day. So if you're walking on a pilgrimage, you're walking 10 to 15 miles a day. That's all you can matter, muster, right? You walk, you rest. And because you're doing it not for a day or a week, but several. And so three days before you get to this church, you can see it. You're walking towards it. And again, you're not really walking as a tourist. You're walking as part of a spiritual journey or quest. It's the thing you can always see. It occupies all of your thoughts. Um, and that is a really important idea for pilgrims. Um, just for the sake of giggles, I looked up the population of Chart today. It's 38,000 people. Um, and, and the only population numbers I can, I can see is from 1793 is the earliest. It's 15,000 people, right? So that's, that's a very small place for a very big church. Here is one of the portals of this church. 
and we'll spend a little bit of time looking at some of these things here. So let me get the text there, which will help us. I don't know why it went black. This is what's called the Royal Portal. And there are there are some doorways in churches that only certain kinds of people can walk through. And so, and some, some portals in churches that are called Royal portals because they have depictions of Kings and Queens on them. And this is one such, one such um, example. So it is a very typical, and we've seen this before tripartite door with a tympanum jams, voussoirs and archivolts, just like we've seen. And when we look at the, the the figures the jam figures here you might notice that they look a little bit like breadsticks that they're long and cylindrical they they the, their bodies don't look super accurate but now i want to show you this and again i don't know why my text went white but i'm going to fix that because that's how i do so look at these objects here and isn't it interesting that on the same part of the church, we have two different sets of jams that look totally differently. And the answer for this, and, and I would say, well, why is that? And the answer is twofold, right? Twofold. Answer number one, it's because they were made by different artists. And there's no expectation that Bob makes things the same as Jim. But secondly, 70 years is a really long time. I mean, 70 years ago, my mom was two weeks old, right? Like, actually, no, one week old today, right? That's a long time for things to stay still. And so between 1150 and 1220, one of the things that happens is that the proportions of the human body go back to something a little bit more realistic. Uh, and that's a really important idea. These buildings are alive. When walking around them, you will see things that look different about them. One of the things that's fascinating about these churches is how they are just filled with sculpture and architectural decoration. Um, and when you go to Paris, and you should, you can get to Chartres on a train in like 30 minutes. The train's going to cost you like seven euro. And as Chartres might make it, and as the, 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 the picture I showed you a little while ago might make clear, it's a pretty small place. Walking to the church is no problem. And it's absolutely worth your visit. When we look at the interior, you can see the incredible sense of verticality that's present here. The nave has become a little bit uh, a little bit more narrow, although we'll, we we will see it change. But there is a greater sense of verticality. And one of the things that will happen as the Gothic uh, craze rips across Europe, is that we will notice the ways in which churches are going to kind of be in competition for one another to make the most extravagant, fancy, high woo, church they can. In this way, it's not unlike Las Vegas. I mean, Las Vegas is all about creating the new super cool hotel so that you go spend your money there. I mean, it's the only reason why they have the Luxor, which is Egypt, the Venetian, which is Italian, Paris, I think it's just called Paris, which is French. I mean, all of those hotels do the exact same thing. They provide you with a bed and a shower and a bathroom, but they decorate it in a new way to attract your tourism dollar. And I don't want to sound cynical, but these churches are in the same kind of business because in going there, you, do, you give out your tourism dollar, not only to the church with the collection plate, but also for local businesses like inns, hostel, hostels, and restaurants. So I wanted to show you some stained glass window because I always think they're beautiful. And if we were in a dark classroom, maybe they will, be, they will even shine for you. So we have a baptism of Christ over here and what looks to be a last judgment scene. Like some of these elements by now, you recognize them, don't you? An angel blowing a trumpet, people crying, cr crawling out of their graves. Uh, here we have a massacre of the innocents uh, scene, which is from the, the Jewish Bible. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but I like. it looks like, uh, what's the name of the tree guy in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? I am Groot. It's Groot right there. You can see the ways in which paint is applied for details on these things. Again, remember this, the seashell, right? This person has gone to um, Santiago de Compostelo. We've already looked at this. 
Um, this is likely King David with playing his harp. This is the famous rose window. And underneath it is a, is a, a really lovely depiction of Mary and Christ. I'll show it to you in a second. I want to talk a little bit about the, how these windows were paid for. Um, I had a kind of a, a really lovely um, it was, and certainly a really elderly professor at the University of Arizona when I was an undergrad named Dr. Williams, um, who wrote a book. And I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't Prayers in Stone. Maybe it was. In any case, the book was all about the economics of stained glass windows. And what would happen is when this church was being constructed, the 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 church would go to a local guild. We'll see. We'll say a little bit more about guilds um, when we uh, when we talk about the Renaissance. But let's say you are a you are a, uh, I almost said a glade. Let's say you're a furrier, right? You you make things from furs. Um, the, the church might come to you and say, hello, Bob the Furrier, would you and your guild like to sponsor a window uh, in the church? Um, and you and your guild would pay for a window that would go in the church as an organization you can feel really good about the, uh, about the idea of help decorate this church. And it also serves a little bit like um, advertising for your organization. So I was just thinking about the scoreboard uh, at the Louisiana Tech um, football field, right? It's got advertisements on it as well. It's the same kind of idea. And so often when we look at the stained glass windows for these churches, there might be a guy working in a workshop um, like making a fur coat or something. And that was likely paid for by the, the Furrier Guild. One of the cool things about these churches is the ways in which the windows look differently under different lighting condition. So on a bright sunny day, um, the, 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 dark, the dark purple becomes lighter because of the intensity of the light that shines through. When it's cloudy, it has a, a, just a different sense of gravity about it. And so, so this idea is one that will happen in a lot of Gothic churches. This kind of rose window is called because the shape of the canes kind of make it look like it's floral. And we will see this in all kinds of churches. So this has been the Church of Chartres, Chartres Cathedral in Chartres, France. Let's talk about Notre Dame Cathedral. Notre Dame Cathedral is in Paris. This building was begun in 1163, and the flying buttresses and nave were done to such an extent that they were nearly completed by 1190. Now, this is the first church that was designed with um, flying buttresses as a part of the original architectural elements of it. And I'll show you those flying buttresses in just a second, but for the time being, here you can see it. Flying buttresses are these spindly, skeletal-like things that rise up on the outside of a church and provide just enough outside support there to prevent this wall from falling down. This is going to sound kind of silly, but I'll, I'll try. Walls want to fall down. They totally want to fall down. They want to fall down. Gravity wants to take them down. Now, this wall can't fall in, the roof is holding it there. The only thing this thing is doing is providing enough outside support, enough inertia, so the wall can't fall outwards. We only really need flying buttresses in places where there are windows, because the windows weaken that wall. So all along the nave and the apse here, we have these flying buttresses. Now, one of the really cool things about the first time I ever visited Paris and I was there for a month was that I would just come to the back end of this, of the church here. There's a great fountain there and I would eat lunch and I'll never forget one day in the, in the summer of 1999, watching this cat attack small children. It was, there's like a feral cat problem on the back end of Notre Dame. So when you go to Notre Dame, this is a Brian Zygmunt uh, travel tip, beware of wild cats. And I remember this like yesterday, I was eating a peanut butter sandwich listening to D'Angelo and watching a cat attack small children. Here's the plan of this church. 
And at first, it might be difficult to discern what the, what the plan of the building is. But if you think about it critically, it's pretty easy to make out. If we were to take a, a, a crayon and color in the high parts of the church, um, we would color all this in. We would color that in. And despite the fact that the overhead view is this way, that and that is this part and this part and that all is higher than the side aisles here that's important to keep in mind all of these things here all of the number fives along this part those are all chapels for relics sansarnan was kind of cute with its relics wasn't it it had you know 10 little absidial chapels and now we have quite literally dozens of them. I'm not sure how many, two, four, six, eight, ten. Yep, easily dozens. And so that's the plan of the church. And here is a relatively bad view of the inside of the church looking towards the apse. And so this is the main entrance of the church. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a second. But you can see we have pointed arches. One of the major developments within Gothic architecture during this time frame was the development of what's called a clerestory. A clerestory and so this is our main arc right here pointed arch and then we have these little windows here and the clerestory is this third row of windows here that provide illumination for the inside of the church now whenever you go to these places i joke you want the the um the the so-called uh postcard photo and when I was here most recently in 2013, there was all kind of restoration work being done on the front of the church. But you get the idea that the towers in this instance look quite similar as opposed to Chartres, where they look remarkably different. They're symmetrical and you can go up the towers of the church and by all means you should. And what I did was just brought in all kinds of eye candy for you to appreciate just the, the, just the remarkable nature of the exterior of this church. Now, if you weren't um, paying attention in January of 2019, I think it was January 2019, I was sitting at my desk in this office um, and a little thing rang on my phone and it seemed that Notre Dame in Paris was on fire. That fire raged all day. Um, the roof of this church now isn't there anymore. The central spire that you see right here, it's not there either. And I remember that night sitting at my kitchen table, eating dinner with my wife and my two sons with CNN on, watching th this and the people on the news not knowing whether or not this church was going to survive. And I started crying. I started crying. And, and, my, and my son, who was what a little over four and a half, said, you know, why are you crying? And so I, I talked about the church and why it's important. And the next day, um, I was I was chatting with with my wife and and said, you know, I'm certainly very, very sad that, that what has happened to that church. And the church is still standing, thank heavens. Although the central spire is gone, the roof is gone. But I said to her, churches burn. They're made out of wood. I mean, that ceiling vault is made out of wood. It's covered with other things, but ceilings are not covered with stone. They can't do that. They've always been covered with wood. Um, the centering in this spire was covered with, was made with wood. And this looks different than that. And the reason why is the one that was originally made also burnt down. And so I don't mean to suggest that it wasn't a tragedy. It certainly was. And I certainly um, lament what had happened. Churches catching on fire is one of the great traditions of Gothic churches and Romanist churches for that matter. And it's my fervent hope that, that Notre, Dame, Notre Dame will rebuild in a way that is lovely and profound. And so I just wanted to show you some of the architectural sculpture from this because it's just rich and, and decorative. And here you can see Jesus blessing Mary. Again, the church is built in honor of Mary. Um, this is the, is, looks to be like the death of Mary. I mean, many of the images involve her. Here are jam figures, architectural sculpture all over the outside of the church.
when we talked about medieval manuscripts, I talked about the horror vacui, and the same is certainly true here. Here you can get a good idea of the this architectural skeleton of all of this, this flying buttress that just reaches out with a pinky and that pinky worth of force is all that they need to keep things still. Oh, there's a good flying buttress right there. See, they've made an arch, they've made a half of an arch and inertia keeps all of that in place. It's really quite fantastic. When you walk in the the central portal of this church, uh, one of the things that you will see is a sign written in every language imaginable that says, beware of pickpockets. And so Notre Dame is a place where many tourists go. It is also a place where many pickpockets go. And so one needs to be careful when they are in there because people come around looking for the next easy paycheck. Mary and Jesus. When you see someone standing like this, holding that, it kind of looks like a palm frond. That is a sign of martyrdom. I don't know who this is, but it's a martyred saint of some of some ilk or fashion. A little Mary and a little Jesus. And I can tell you that this object also is not from the 13th century. This is 19th century, I would wager. That's a cute baby Jesus. When you go up the, the tower, and you should, you can just see all of these sort of structures. These are called grotesques or gargoyles. And for lack of a better phrase, they're water spouts. These are meant to get water away from the foundation of the church. Here she is in front of the, the rose window. And here is a picture of the inside of this church. Um, when I was here in 2013, there was like a family of wrens or something living in here. There were birds flying everywhere. I'd never seen anything quite like that before in a church. And so here you can see our, our pointed arches and the, the proportions of this church look a little bit more narrow, don't they? And part of this is what happens over time is the inside gets more and more narrow and higher and higher. It provides a greater sense of verticality. Here are your obligatory stained glass window pictures and your view of Paris from one of the towers. I'm gonna to call your attention to a couple of things. One of them is we'll look at um, in our next artifact. And this right here is a cool little church called Saint-Chapelle. I mean, it is little and cool, doesn't quite do it justice. And over there is the towards the Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower, which um, maybe has surplanted Notre Dame as the symbol of Paris. But for 800 years, Victor Hugo said that all, all distances in France were measured from Notre Dame. Here's your obligatory picture of the gargoyle that so inspired Victor Hugo himself. And I'll give you just a little bit more stained glass windows because many of the stained glass windows in Notre Dame date from the original time frame. And so here are a couple of them. One of Mary of Jesus. And here is an original mirror of the Annunciation. We'll look at plenty of Annunciations in due time. This is an angel. You can see Ave Maria, Hail Mary, and then a Mary who was once seated on her uh, stool has now risen up. This, my friends, is a, a, a very brief introduction into the kinds of architecture that we see in Paris and Saint-Denis during the Gothic time frame. Our next, our next excursion will be into a couple of other Parisian churches, and then after that, we're going to look at some fantastic things outside of Italy. So here we go.